Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sanzar Cocker. I was born in Seattle, Washington, but when I was five years old, my family moved from the United States to Afghanistan during the Civil War. And I grew up in Peshawar. I went to school in Islamabad, and I went back to the US just for college, to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I started working with Merrill Lynch in New York, and then my father called me up and he said, you know, the US doesn't need you, Afghanistan does. So after just one year in the US, I moved back to Afghanistan. And it's been almost 10 years now in Afghanistan. There are not many positive aspects that you can think about that has come out of the 30 years of war. It's very difficult to see any good thing that has come out. But if there's one thing that you had to pick, I would say is that we now have an opportunity to leapfrog over the challenges, the inefficiencies, the mistakes that other countries have made. And one example of this that is often quoted is in the telecom industry, where instead of Afghanistan stringing landlines to every house all over the country, we jumped straight to GSM into 3G. Now we have another opportunity to leapfrog over the financial crises, the recession, the depression, all the different problems that different countries have faced in the financial sector, and learn from that to build Afghanistan as the world's first Sharia-compliant model multi-asset exchange. So why do we need an exchange in Afghanistan? And why do we need it now? There's a, there's a gap in Afghanistan. On one hand, you have money, and you have people with money. On the other hand, you have people that need money or businesses that need money. You have investments that need capital in Afghanistan to grow. And so many of us know this. Uh, businesses need money to grow. Uh, if you have a bottling factory, you need money to buy more machinery to build a second line so that you can produce more. Um, then when you can produce more, you'd be able to access other provinces in Afghanistan. You'd be able to even export to international provinces or countries in the world. It's also you need money to provide an exit for existing investors. Maybe you have a business that you have an investor that's part of your business, and that investor might want to take some of his money out to go and invest it in something else. But there might not be an opportunity or a mechanism for an exit for that uh, particular investor. He might not have an opportunity to, to find an Afghan that's willing to pay that much more for his particular shares in that particular company. And once you have that capital, he can go invest it in new businesses. Um, and you can explore future opportunities that are very capital intensive. Some of the opportunities in Afghanistan that were discussed about mining are extremely capital intensive. You need tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars for some of the, the, the very basic mining projects. And how are you going to raise all this capital? It's, it's a very difficult problem to a country like Afghanistan. And then lastly, of course, our government. Our government treasury is, is, is at its bottom right now, but we need money in order to fix the Salang Tunnel in order to build the railroad to China, to do all these government in investment projects. So all these things need money. On the other hand, there is money in Afghanistan, right? There are many Afghans that have money under their mattresses, at home, in banks. Um, they're saving for a rainy day. Afghanistan has some of the highest savings rate because it's a cash economy. You have to buy your car. You have to buy your house. You have to have save for a medical emergency. So there's a lot of savings. There's money that's stagnant in the economy. There's diaspora Afghans all over the world, in Australia, in Europe, in the Americas, that have money, and they want to invest in their country, but there's not a mechanism to do so. There's also money that's already in Afghanistan that's restricted to stay in Afghanistan. They're not allowed to invest in other countries. Banks, for example, the 17 banks, they have a certain percentage that they have to keep of their money in Afghanistan. But there's no opportunity for them to properly invest. And we'll talk about that more as well. There are mobile money, float money. There's pension funds. All these that are required by law to keep their money in Afghanistan. There's foreign investors. Afghanistan is a very hot topic all over the world. And there's plenty of investors that I've even spoken to that would love to diversify to a high risk, high reward environment like Afghanistan. And then lastly, there's developmental financial institutions. These are the OPEC, World Bank, IFC, Asian Development Bank that have investment money and are looking for good, solid opportunities. Now, that's the, that's the gap, right? On one side, you have the money. On the other side, you have the people that need the money. How do you bring those together? How do you solve that problem, that gap? Where is the marketplace for the buyers and sellers of financing in Afghanistan? Why is it not working? Well, one, why it's not working is that the banks have very high interest rates. There is a high risk premium for Afghanistan. They have very high collateral requirements. They require guarantees, 
right? So some of these are required by the central bank. You have to have you know, 200%, 300%, 400% collateral on an investment because it's very difficult to uh, foreclose on a loan because there are five different titles to a land. Um, it's very difficult to get things through the courts. So there's many reasons why the banks uh, are not loaning or not providing uh, loans or financing. But also, Afghans don't want debt-based, interest-based financing. They want a Sharia-compliant product. They don't want usury. They don't want interest. So they want ijara, musharikat, mudaraba. They want Islamic products. Donor funding, as we know, is, is also decreasing. Um, budgets are, are, are decreasing over the years. There is a capital flight out of the country because of all of this. Because there's not opportunities to invest in Afghanistan, Afghans are taking their money abroad. Last year, the, they estimated over $4 billion officially went out of Afghanistan, most likely to Dubai. This year, the estimated that probably doubled in terms of how much going out of the country. We need that money in Afghanistan. We need to build our businesses. We need to make jobs for our citizens. We need to build our roads and schools and infrastructure. So how do we keep that money here? How do we provide opportunities for investments in Afghanistan? We need that market. Now, once we have that market, you can say, great, it's great for those individuals, but how does it affect a society? What are the other benefits? There's three benefits. There's microeconomic, there's macroeconomic, and there's sustainability benefits that affects um, uh, from an exchange. So first I'm gonna talk about micro. When an entrepreneur is building an idea or a business in Afghanistan, if he or she knows that in the future they'll be able to raise significant capital or uh, financing for that business, they'll be more productive, they'll be more competitive, they'll be more entrepreneurial, they'll be more encouraged to go after their idea. But if they know there's no financing available, they won't be as encouraged to go after an idea because there's not a way to make, it, make their dream a reality. Also, there's a big ecosystem that comes around with a financial market and a capital market. You need high quality jobs, accountants, auditors, IT, researchers, all these people, traders, brokers, to make up the ecosystem that is a financial market. And this is something that's very important to provide jobs for the youth of Afghanistan. It levels the playing field. Right now, there might be certain families or certain organizations that are very wealthy. They can afford to invest millions of dollars in a business. But other organizations that might be very well done, they, it's very difficult for them to raise the capital to expand and compete on the same level. So it levels the playing field for, uh, to allow businesses to grow. It connects the formal and informal markets. So you have the hawala dealers, you have friends and family, you have financing that's available. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not very transparent. It's, it's a, it's a, uh, to, to, bring, to bring it together to the formal system is very important for the economy to grow. It provides intent incentives. Right now, if you talk to a business, they say, why should I keep audited financials? Right? Maybe the government will tax me more. They don't have an incentive to be transparent. They don't have an incentive not to pay bribes. But if they know, in the future, in order to list on a stock exchange, I need to have 10 years of audited financials, they will, from the beginning, start to keep their finances correctly because they know that someday someone might be watching them and asking for them. And then when they do become public and some of their shares are owned by the public, that, that, that scrutiny, that they become under the microscope, so they raise their standards, they raise their financial standards, they stop paying bribes, they raise their environmental standards. And lastly, on that, is that it attracts investment. This might be even the most important option. If I speak to an investor in New York and tell him, you know, you need to put $50 million in Afghanistan, he'll say, well, great, I'll invest that. I might get a good return, but how do I get my investment back? What is the exit strategy, right? Because I don't want to be there forever. We need to have an exit strategy for every investment. And um, if they knew that there was an exchange or a way for, their, for, for them to share um, their capital or sell their stake in a company, they would be more willing. So having the financial market attracts more direct investment to Afghanistan. And attracting that investment is very, very important. So macroeconomic, that's micro. Macro, it mobilizes the capital that's stagnant. It decreases the money from going abroad. It increases foreign investment to Afghanistan to bring money to Afghanistan. It decreases the dependency on donors. It allows for the government to issue bonds or sukuk, Islamic bonds, to raise money for large infrastructure projects that are needed in Afghanistan. When you have the investment to businesses, sales goes up, consumption goes up. When sales goes up, there's more tax revenue for the government. Foreign exchange receipts increase because you have more exports, so you have more hard currency coming into the country. Very important for the macro economy. And His Excellency President Ashraf Ghani knows this. He knows that how important it is to bring foreign investment to Afghanistan. On his very first cabinet meeting, he assigned 
a whole range of ministers to say, give me a plan for how you're going to provide visas to foreign investors to easily come to Afghanistan. Give me a plan for how you're going to protect the security of foreign investors when they're in Afghanistan. All these ways in order to attract investment to Afghanistan, not only from Afghans that are outside Afghanistan, from foreigners, from institutions all over the world. It makes businesses sustainable. Right? right now, we're a project-based economy. You're going from one project to one contract to one donor to that. We need to focus on customers. And once you have long-term capital, in order to build the machinery and invest in your business, it makes you more durable to withstand shocks in the economy. Socially, every additional job that comes up has a multiplier effect from the friends and family all the way through the economy. Environmental sustainability, very important to bring transparency to businesses. All right, so that's all wonderful flowers, very nice. But there are challenges, of course, in, in any organization, in any initiative in Afghanistan. One of the first and most important challenges is perception. As Madam John mentioned, people don't think of a stock exchange or a financial market when it comes to Afghanistan. They think it's too risky. They think of war, right? Um, and even Afghans themselves, when you talk to them about an exchange or having financial markets, they don't necessarily have the right attitude. And I'd like to share a story that I heard on TED Talks. That I'd, it's one of my favorite stories. And it, it shows how important attitude is. And it's about the London Shoe Company. The London Shoe Company was a company about 100 years ago. And they wanted to expand the manufacturing of their shoes to Africa. So they sent two sales agents to Africa. They sent one sales agent, and he came back, and he said, oh, you know, Africa, nobody wears shoes there. Everyone is barefoot. We can't sell any shoes. Forget about it. The next sales agent, he came back, and he said, do you know what? Nobody wears shoes yet. We can sell to everybody. The market is wide open, right? The same situation, but the attitude is completely different. In Afghanistan, yes, we have no regulations for a stock market, but that gives us the opportunity to bring the best regulations, to learn from the lessons learned, and make our financial market the best in the world. Then they give us other excuses. Well, you know, in Afghanistan, it's very difficult to explain to people in villages about you know, how a stock market works. And I tell them, it's very simple. It's buying and selling, right? And Afghans are some of the fastest learners in the world. And I'll give you an example. If you go to any embassy in Kabul, if you go to the Russian embassy, the Chinese embassy, the Saudi embassy, there's Afghans there that fluently speak Chinese, Arabic, Russian, without any problem. But they've never left Afghanistan. They learn languages very, very quickly. On the other hand, you have internationals that have been in Afghanistan for 15 years, and they don't speak Dari or Pashto. Right? Afghans anywhere in the world can learn faster than you can imagine. <laughs> they say, well, you know, businesses are not very transparent. Well, if you give them an incentive to be transparent, if you tell them once they have a stock exchange in the future, there'll be a way, there'll be a way to raise capital, that provides incentives in order to become transparent. Right? It's a chicken and the egg. You need regulations. You need to start somewhere. Right? It's a 10-year project. Let's start with the first regulations, which, alhamdulillah, have already been passed. People say, well, there aren't businesses that would be able to meet international standards. We're standing in the Bayat Media Center right now. Right? Wonderful company. They need capital to expand. There's plenty of state-owned enterprises, banks, insurance companies, bottlers. All of them need financing. And then they say, well, what about the trading volume? Once you get started, how will people start using this? You know, will really Afghans be traders? And I say, ah, oh, come on. 5,000 years of traders are in Afghanistan. Right? The word businessman in Pashtun that is tujar, traders. Every Afghan in his blood knows that you buy low and sell high. You don't think if you explain to them how you can buy and sell stocks and agriculture commodities. Very, very simple. They'll learn like that, and we'll have the, some of the highest trading volume in the world. So the future. We finished the 10-year plan for how we're going to build the financial industry of Afghanistan. The Afghan government has established the Securities and Exchange Commission in order to begin looking at the regulations. Although there's already regulations for the primary market and secondary market for capital notes. We've automated with the central bank and with NetLink support the primary market for capital notes. Right now, we're automating the financial um, markets for foreign currencies so that existing products that are in Afghanistan, they don't need additional regulations. They're already there. Sarai Shahzada has a very active foreign currency market. We are planning agriculture commodities. And we've identified the first three products that are going to be trading on world markets, including which are going to be pomegranates, saffron, and sesame. Very, very high quality Afghan products that can compete internationally. But right now, the farmers don't have access. If someone needs 10 tons of pomegranates in the US, well, how, who do they talk to? There's not a mechanism. There's not an exchange. There's not a marketplace for that. And then, of course, public sukuk for the government to raise bonds. And then, inshallah, 10 years from now, we'll have the first IPOs and have equities traded on the Afghanistan Stock Exchange. Thank you for your time.